one. Hello, everybody. Everybody, my name is Kevin O'Brien, and this is the YR Foundation webinar series. We are taking a, a break during the summer, but we're back for this special presentation, Julia for Our Lovers, and it's presented by Kyla McConnell, who's joining us from Freiburg in Germany. Uh, so before I hand over to Kyla, just to sort of uh, thank her actually uh, for uh, doing this talk. Just to sort of quickly remark that this is the, uh, related to Julia and it's aimed at beginners of our, or people who are sort of career young in terms of programming in Julia and so on. And it, it's uh, not a high level uh, technical talk. But if you are interested in a high level technical talk about Julia and internals and stuff like that, JuliaCon is taking place at the end of the month, 27th, 28th, and, or 28th, 29th and 30th of July. Uh, that's, you know, two weeks essentially. But also there's going to be a series of workshops in advance of the conference. So if you're interested in finding out about more about Julia, there is plenty coming up. The, the website is juliacon.org. When I get a chance, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, just as a sort of quick remark uh, that we why our hope to have uh, returned to doing a regular pattern of webinars in September. If you'd like to give a talk, uh, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Uh, our usual slot is at 6 p.m. UTC uh, on Thursdays. Although we will make arrangements otherwise, if that's uh, if to suit people. And one more thing, if one thing we'd be particularly interested in is talks that relate to R and Python and Julia also uh, in relation to sustainable development goals and how that works. Uh, just if you're on the chat, something we're very interested in is finding out how many uh, the, the, the community all over the world this case, it's the R community, but we might also be joined by quite a few from the Julia Land community. Something we're very interested in is seeing the scope, uh, or the, the, the range uh, and extent of the both communities all around the world. So if you're looking at uh, uh, watching this on YouTube, just sort of say hello from Freiburg, hello from Ireland and so on. It's just a really great. Uh, I think I've said enough. I think I'm gonna hand over now to Kyla and let Kyla get cracking there. So over to you, Kyla. Thanks. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you to the YR Foundation and um, to Gavin for inviting me today. This is a topic that I'm really excited to talk about, um, something a little bit different for me, and I hope that I can inspire you with it a little bit to think about a dual language workflow. So let's get started um, with Julia for our lovers. Uh, just a little background about me. My name is Kyla McConnell. Um, I'm a PhD student in linguistic at the University of Freiburg. So I'm over here in the uh, cozy southwest corner of Germany. And I do a lot of um, quantitative experimental psycholinguistic work. But I'm also a huge fan of R and R stats. I co organize R Ladies Freiburg together with um, Elisa Schneider and Julia Muller. Um, and we, we try to do a lot of content there. But I've recently discovered the joys of Julia. So for this, I have to thank um, the instructors at the University of Potsdam. So um, Reinhold Siegel and Doug Bates and um, Philip Alday for teaching me a lot of what I'm gonna show you today. And discovering Julia has really changed my workflow, which used to be um, exclusively in R. So you'll see today that I come from academia, from a research perspective. I use a technique called um, linear mixed effects models quite often. And you'll see that in my demo. And you'll see kind of that's the style that I'm coming from. Um, but I want to make this as broad as possible. And I hope that you can you know, start to imagine your own methodology in the spaces that I show you of, of my methods. Great. So first, I'll tell you a bit about Julia, um, what it is, why you might want to add it to your workflow. Then I'm going to switch over to a little bit more hands-on. Um, or well, I'm going to show some code. I'll show you the basics of Julia. I'll tell you about using R and Julia together and introduce a package called R call, which makes working with R and Julia very easy. And then I'll show you the example workflow that comes from something um, that I do, which is this linear mixed model with the mixed model pack. But again, it's, it's intended as an example. 
So I won't cover installing Julia. I won't show you how I went from installing Julia to getting um, iJulia and Jupyter Notebooks going on my on my system. But I've kind of put a link here to one of the to a tutorial if you want to. You're just really getting started. I also won't cover a lot of programming concepts in Julia. I'm going to leave this to the Academy. They have really great videos um, in a couple of streams. So there's one for nervous beginners, or there's one for people who have programming experience, and also one for data science. And I'm not going to go too much into the you know the stats or the the packages that I'm using for modeling. I'm going to leave this kind of open for your imagination. So what is Julia? Julia is a general purpose programming language, but it's really popular in data science communities, um, primarily because it was built with data science and machine learning in mind. It's really optimized for some workflows having to do with data science. It's free and open source, you probably know that from R. And it's really developed to be readable like Python, but compiled quickly like C. So in the past, you've always had this trade-off between um, scripting languages, which are easy on the human, and um, compiler or lower language, lower level languages like C, which put a lot of burden on the, on the programmer, but are easier on the computer. And Julia tries to kind of get the best of both worlds in this sense. Julia is also pretty young. So it's been on the scene for less than 10 years, as far as I know, and R is closer to 30 years old. Okay, so why are we interested in Julia? First of all, Julia is fast. Um, these are benchmarks from the Julia Lang um, website running on like a single core machine with Julia 1.0. It's a little bit outdated by now. Um, and you can see that each of these dots is like a different benchmark. And Julia outperforms R very consistently, usually um, by one or two orders of magnitude. So it's a lot faster. Uh, I think some very beginners in Julia might not see this in some situations because of the just-in-time compiler. So Julia is pretty bare bones when you get it and you have to load the packages or when you load packages or do things for the first time, it compile a lot of resources. But just keep in mind that, you know, the big picture is it's a lot faster. And this allows you to also gain in model complexity compared to R. So maybe you share the experience of um, fitting a model or trying to fit a model in R and having it not only take a long time, but then ultimately fail or crash your R session, um, which can lead you to having to fit a simpler model or change your methods based on the power of your um, programming language, which is not great. If you switch to Julia, you can, um, you're not gonna sacrifice readability or reproducibility. You can use a lot of the same techniques there. And with a dual language workflow, you really don't have to give up on our packages that you know really well. You don't have to um, stop using the tutorials and resources from the R community. And I think you'll see in the demo that the code that you produce will still be probably um, able to be shared with colleagues who use Julia. So I'm gonna jump in, but for those who are um, maybe coming exclusively from R, just a few notes on how you actually work with Julia. Once you've installed it, um, you can use the REPL. That would be this image here. It's basically analogous to the R console where you just um, write code and instantly get results. But you can also make a Julia script, so like an R script. So everything in the script will be considered Julia code, or you can do a Julia markdown, which would be like an R markdown. So you have code and text. And you can use an uh, integrative developer environment like Visual Studio Code. This would kind of be your, yeah, analogous to R Studio. I'm gonna use Jupyter Notebooks today because I like using them for demos. Um, that's what this image is here, if you're not familiar with it. And basically you can have text and run lines and get the output. Um, Pluto Notebooks, by the way, is something very similar built in Julia and uh, for Julia, but I'm going to be using Jupyter Notebooks. So let's um, go ahead and switch over to that. Here. Oops, that's for later. So now you see I'm working in a Jupyter Notebook. Um, if you're familiar with a Jupyter Notebook, it launches in a browser, but it's powered by generally by Python, but I'm powering it here with Julia. You can see from the little Julia icon in my slightly outdated Julia version. And a Jupyter Notebook combines text and code. So you'll see that this is text, the code blocks um, will contain Julia code. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about Julia basics. 
absolute basics. And then I'm going to introduce the R call package, which is your main powerhouse for working with R and Julia together. Um, tell you about moving variables back and forth between the two environments and a little bit about some packages for data science. And then I'm going to switch to a second notebook and show you an example workflow. But first, let's get to know Julia. So um, again, this is all Julia code. And you can see just like R, we can do comments with hashtags. We can also do these fancy comments with multiple lines. And we can do all sorts of math. <laughs> so not really that exciting, but you can see that we can do like addition and multiplication and everything else that you would expect. So we can also make variables. We assign variables with the equal sign. So here I'm making one called number and giving it the value 10 and one called number two and giving it the value 1.5. And then we can look at the variable types. So Julia sees 10 um, as int64, which is an integer. 64 else if you with the amount of it stores, um, it uses to store this in your computer's memory. So yeah, number here is seen as an integer, 1.5. So number two is seen as a float. But in the Julia type system, these are both seen as the abstract type of number. So it knows that these are both numbers. So you can do things like add the two variables or what. You can also use the convert function to change um, data types. So here we can take our number, which again was 10. And if we convert it to um, a float, then we get 10.0. A float again is a floating point number. So that's how it sees um, decimal numbers. Okay, that's all good. I, I don't think I need that chalk to you. Um, but let's talk also about strings because there's something here that's a little bit different from R. And that is that double quotes and single quotes are not interchangeable. So they, they are different um, data types. So here you'll see I'm making a variable called um, hashtag, which I give the value of R stats with a double quote and one called language, which I give the value of R with single quotes. And I'm ending both of these lines in a semicolon. That's a Julia code convention, which will suppress the output. So leave it off, um, you'll get some output here, but if I leave it, if I put it on, it will suppress the output. So I have these two variables, hashtag and language. Hashtag with the double quotes um, is seen as a string, which is what we would expect. But R with the single quotes um, is seen as a different data type, which is the character. So you just have to be aware of that because if you try to make a long string with single quotes, you're going to get an error because um, Julia wants to read it as a character and the character can only have um, one character. One small difference too is that you can concatenate strings. So you put two strings together with the star and the asterisk. So if I run this, we'll get that put together. <clears throat> yeah, if you need uh, to get help. So if you see a function that you don't know in Julia, you can always pull up the function documentation with the question mark. So if we look at the print ln function, if we proceed that with a question mark, then we're gonna get documentation, which tells us that it prints um, the string and a new line or prints whatever it's given in a new line. So that's a good resource for if you're looking at you know, a function that you don't know. Okay, that was our whirlwind tour of um, the very basics of Julia, but what I really wanna talk about is R and R and Julia. So I'm gonna move on to the call package. And I put the documentation here if you wanna check it out, but this is the main workhorse for um, dual language R and Julia work. And there's comparable packages for working with Julia in R. So right now we're working um, in Julia with R, but you could also work in R with Julia but it seems to be more efficient computationally to work in Julia and um, use R. Also, I think the syntax is, is easier in this direction or it's easier to work with. Um, you can take, you know, you can make your own opinion on that, but um, yeah, this is the way that I like to do it. So working in Julia with R. And the very basics here are just that you can call R code with an R and some quotes. So we'll see that. First, you have to have the R call package um, installed. So you can use like your package manager here and then you could install the R call package. 
I already have that installed, so I've commented it out. But I'm first gonna call using our call um, because using is kind of like how we call library in R to load a package. So let's use our call, let's load it into our environment. And now you see we can instantly switch into R and use the functions that we know. So say I'm working in Julia and I don't know the Julia command for counting the number of characters. Um, if I have the R call package loaded in my environment, I can use R and um, some quotes. And then I can write R code pretty much exactly like I would write R code if I was working exclusively in R. And you can see from the output that this gives us like an R object and it looks a lot like our R output. So it even has these number, <laughs> these numbers that we know from R. So for another example, let's look at R. Say we wanna make a random normal distribution, 10 errors, mean of 100, standard deviation of 15, rounded to one decimal point. Then we can just switch to R and do this um, and we'll get the same kind of output we would expect if we were working in R. You can also do longer code blocks. So here I'm using three quotes just to show that this um, should span multiple lines. And I can make a little array here where I put my favorite languages, um, Julia, R, and Python. And I can do pretty much what I could do in R. So I can paste, so concatenate, I have, and then the length of my favorite languages. So I have three favorite languages. And when you make things in R through so Julia, they, they stick around. So later on in this script or in a different um, block, you can see that the fav lengths variable, it, it stays around. So it's not a temporary thing, but it's, it stays. Um, this means you can also load packages to R. So um, I don't know how to work with R without tidyverse. Let's go ahead and load the tidyverse into my um, R session here. You see, I get the same long output that I would get in R. And now that I've loaded tidyverse, I can do some tidyverse things. So one of the functions of tidyverse is a tibble. This allows you to make a data frame. It's a different, it's a variation on the data frame, but it only works if you use, if you have the tidyverse package loaded. So I can use that to make a tibble, just a tidyverse uh, data frame, where I have the language and then my rating out of 10 for these languages. Then we can continue to use first things. So say I want to arrange my um, data frame here by descending rating. This is, um, yeah, tidyverse code in R. And you can see that I still prefer R over Julia, <laughs> but um, Julia is close, close behind. You can also change um, variables in your R environment. So mutate is how I make a new column. So I'm gonna make a new column called percent and set it to kind of a row wise adaptation of the rating column, I'm just timesing it by 10. And if I call ratings again, then you see that I can add, add this column um, in R as I usually would. And of course, this means that you can keep your ggplot skills around. So ggplot, um, you can call ggplot within your R code block and you'll be able to work, uh, yeah, just like you would in R. And it integrates pretty well into the Julia, like into the stupider notebook and into Julia in general. So you don't have to give up on your hours of um, ggplot uh, learning <laughs> time. Okay, but what about Julia? I just did a whole bunch of R and then maybe that wasn't so exciting, but um, how do we talk about between Julia and R back and forth? So here I'm making a Julia variable back in Julia where, which is called greeting and it says, hello there users of R. And we can actually go to our R, um, R code. And if we put a dollar sign in front of a variable name, we can tell R to go into Julia, find the variable of that name um, and bring it back into R. So say I wanna use the buffer function of R and I wanna grab the greeting variable from Julia. I can start it with the dollar sign. <laughs> you see then it um, shouts back me the uppercase version of this variable. So I'll show you again. Here I make um, a Julia variable called HRS for hours. And then I can switch to R in the same little block here and I make an MNS, so a minutes variable, which is 60 times the value of the Julia variable hours. 
and then we can continue to work with these. So for example, I can paste, um, there are six or 180 minutes in three hours. So here I have a R variable. So it's just called by its normal name and a Julia variable. So it's presupposed with this dollar sign. One thing I think is really cool is that you can also substitute, substitute Julia operands into your code with the same kind of syntax. So this is a function that I know in Julia, but I don't know off the top of my head how to do it in R. And it will look in this longer string for the first instance of this substring and return the um, index locations. So in we all love R, the word love first shows up at index positions eight to 11. That would be like, you know, character eight to character 11. And say I wanna do this in R. So here I have um, the first sentence of 100 years of solitude that I'm loading into my R environment. So many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Arleando Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. Okay, so maybe I find the first instance of the word afternoon. Uh, what's really cool is that I can put the dollar sign and then use a Julia function and R will call this into R and do it basically in R. So then um, we'll take kind of the R solitude um, variable and find the first instance of afternoon and it returns the indices there. Looks a little different because it's the R output, but it does the same, the same thing. Okay, so that's really cool. Um, how do we get objects back to Julia once we've done them in R? So this has all been kind of directional towards R. And these are where the macros R put and R get come, come into play. Now R put and R get are macros from the um, R call package. So you have to have R call loaded. And macros are basically versions of, um, you can think of them as like meta code. It's like higher level Julia code that alters Julia code. Um, you don't have to totally understand what a macro is to use a macro. And you can identify them by the at sign. So that's why an at R put. And as you can imagine, um, R put will take something from Julia, a variable, and it will put it into R. And, and R get will look for a variable in R and get it into Julia. And both of these will keep the same variable name and it will keep them, so they'll both kind of stay around in both environments. So for example, let's get this solitude um, string from R using R. So we use the macro at R get. And then we just give the name of the variable we want to get. And then we'll see when we call it that now we have this, um, this string in our Julia environment with the same name. So it's called solitude. And then we can work with it the same way. So we can use these index positions to pull out the word afternoon, for example. So let's do that again. Um, here in R, I'm gonna make, again, a random normal distribution for whatever reason. Um, I have 100 numbers a mean of 25, standard deviation of five rounded to one decimal point. And so this is what R um, has created for me tonight. And now I can get that into Julia. So I will call um, the macro R get, and then the variable dist and pull that into Julia. And then I can check things like, okay, how long is it? It has 100 items. And then I can do things to it that maybe I know how to do better in Julia than I know how to do in R. For example, say I want to take the square root of each element. Then mm -hmm. there's a function um, sqrt for a square root. And the dot will tell it to uh, broadcast. So basically what uh, this will do is just take each element and take the square root. So say I take my Julia um, distribution and I run the square root on it, then it will return the square root. So have created and I can put this back um, into R if I want to. So if I put this back into R and then look at what R has gotten, then you see that R now also has the square root version of the data frame. Examples maybe not super exciting, but basically it shows that you can um, move things back and forth between Julia and do operations in them in the language that you feel most comfortable for that language, uh, for that operation. So before we move on to the little example, I just wanna show a couple of the sort of essential um, Julia packages for data science. So Julia is relatively lightweight in its form and they usually use packages to do some of the basic functionality. 
So for example, you probably want to use Statsbase um, or there's also a statistics package. But there's also um, CSV and data frames that will allow you to read in CSV and also like TSV files. And data frames will allow you to do a little bit of data wrangling. So I'm not going to show you a whole lot, but the um, documentation is pretty good. So let's load in the stats base function. This will allow us to do things like um, take the mean. They also have this cool function for taking the mean and the standard deviation and returning both of them together here um, in a tuple. The stats base package will also allow you to do things like take the z-score. So for a lot of modeling, um, that would be a good first step would be to, to, to z-score some of your numeric predictors. And it also has uh, this summary stats function, which I like, which will give you um, for an array, so for a column or an array, gives you like how many rows there are, how many missing values, the mean, the min, the max. There's a lot of other things that the stats package can do, like return different types of means, um, harmonic means, and so on. But this is just a little, little taster. Then also um, the CSV and data frames packages. So CSV will allow us to read in data frames. Here I'm calling CSV read, and I'm downloading a data frame from the internet. So I'm downloading from the um, R for Data Science Tidy Tuesday repo, a data set about Mario Kart. Um, and then I can use some of the data frames functions here. So for example, um, if I call names, I'll get the names of all nine columns. So it tells us about the Mario Kart track, what kind of race it was. So one lap or three lap, if they person used a shortcut, the player's name, what system they were on, the date, um, the time, which is their record and so on. So we can, for example, um, use this describe function is nice for looking at data, like a very brief first look. It will tell us what the columns are, what their mean values are, how many unique um, um, factors there are if it's categorical. So we see like the tracks from Banshee Boardwalk to Yoshi Valley, there's 16 tracks. It tells us about there's 65 different players on the, on the records list um, for our numeric or for our numeric columns, it will tell us like the median value and the min and the max. Just an overview function. You can also use first to look at the first X amount of lines. So if we look at the first five lines, we can get a look um, for what the data looks like. We're not going to data, I'm just using it to show you the functions. Um, you can also call columns with a dot syntax. So this would call the track column and pull it out as an array. So we'll pull it out of the data frame, all the entries. And sometimes you'll also see columns denoted as symbols, which will be preceded by these um, colons. And that kind of, I think of that as telling Julia that this thing is loaded in its namespace somewhere and it just needs to like look for it and find it. So for example, here the cart data frame, um, looking for the column time, time period. Um, there's some cool wrangling stuff, which I don't have time to show, but for example, in select from the cart data frame, if we want to drop the time period column, we can just call not period and it will drop that column. And there's other various things you can do with select and transform. So you can rename column names and so on. Okay, so that's the very basics of um, Julia and working with Julia in our call. And now I want to give a little demo of my specific use case for Julia and R. And this might get a little bit specific, but I want um, to encourage you to kind of keep an open mind for your own model and think of kind of like the bigger picture of what we, yeah, what kind of uh, opportunities there are for a dual language workflow. So before we get started, I'm, I already preloaded a couple of our favorite packages here. So there's R call, I loaded stats based CSV and data frames. And then I loaded the mixed models package because um, I'm working with mixed models. But this is where you would load like your package for your model. And then I went ahead and loaded my R packages. So Tidyverse and the package that I use all the time for linear mixed specs models in R, um, LME4, because I'm gonna be moving back and forth with some of the output. And I'm gonna show you um, the sleep study data. This is data that is 
probably very familiar to anyone who has done a mixed model and probably not familiar at all to anyone who has not done a mixed model. Um, it's probably because it's included in LME4, in R, and in the mixed models package in Julia. And basically it's 18 participants. I think they were long distance truck drivers. They got to sleep for three hours every night for nine nights. And the dependent variable was their average reaction time speed. Um, I put kind of an example here of some slides um, by Doug Bates that work with this data frame, but basically it's a very small data frame. Just participants, what night it is and their reaction time. And linear mixed effects models, I don't wanna bore you too much, but this is basically a linear regression but it allows you to account for um, repeated measures. So what I mean by that is if you have the same participants participating in the experiment over and over again to account, to tell the model that these data points belong to one person and these data points belong to somebody else, they're not um, totally independent. It's really well used in psychology, cognitive science, linguistics, probably a lot of other fields as well. Now, the reason that I find this a good example is because it's, it can be problematic in R or I, I've run into trouble with it myself. So sometimes the R um, environment like won't, it will say fails to converge. So it won't find a solution. It will run out of time or it will crash. And this leads to very often um, a simplification of the model that's not based on science or theory, but it's based on the, the limitations of, of R. And even when these models do work well, sometimes they take a long time. So that's um, why I'm using it as an example. But in any case, what I would do here is I would load my data into Julia. Um, normally I would use the path, but because this is part of the mixed models package, I can call the data set directly from mixed models. And you'll see I'm putting it into a data frame format. So I'm this data frame, we'll put it into the, yeah, so the type of data frame. Like we saw before, the names command will tell us the column name. So we have a subject column, a day column, and a reaction column. It's, it's a pretty yeah, simple data frame. Let's look at the first lines and we'll see that this is the um, first participant and their reaction on day zero to nine. So every participant gets like an ID and then we see their average reaction time. So this person got slower with sleep deprivation. Uh, if we call summary stats on the reaction column, we can see that it's 180 rows. We have an average reaction time of 298 milliseconds. Minimum 194, it goes up to 466. Okay, so we've loaded in the data, we've taken a look, but now um, I'm more familiar with wrangling in R rather than in Julia. So let's send the data frame to, to, um, to R. So I put it in R with the name sleep. And now I can do my normal data wrangling. So for example, I can take the sleep data frame and I'm gonna group it. So I'm gonna feed it on to the next line and group it by day. So I wanna see day as a, as a grouping factor and summarize it so that I get the mean reaction time every day. And this will return to me um, that on day zero, the average reaction time across everyone was 257. On day nine, it was 351. So we can get kind of an appeal for the data. I can do the exact same code, but um, group by subject. And that will allow me to just look at each subject and see what their average reaction time was. We can see some difference there, nothing too crazy. Maybe it's easier to look at it in a graph. So I can do, um, I'm prepared like a little bit of ggplot code here. And we have, um, yeah, we have each day along the x-axis, each participant gets their own color and the reaction time on the y-axis. So you can see, okay, this is the line that a normal linear regression would fit if it didn't know anything about the, the fact that some of these data points you know, belong to the same person. So we can see, for example, okay, maybe this orange person is a little bit outside of the trend area, but just from looking at this, we can't really see any major problems with this trend line or this linear regression. Uh, but then if we look at it, facet wrapped by subject, so each subject gets their own graph. Then we can see, okay, some of these participants, like maybe this one looks kind of similar to the overall trend, um, maybe this one. But then we see there's a lot of variance. So this person is slow, but gets, uh, sorry, it starts pretty fast, but gets really hindered by sleep deprivation. 
this person's pretty fast and seems to stay pretty fast. Um, but even like this person's a 335 actually seems to speed up with sleep deprivation. So we can see when we look by participant that the model needs to know some information about what belongs to what. Um, that's a little side note on linear mixed models, but the point is also that you can do your data visualization in, in R if that's what's familiar to you. And you don't have to learn how to do it again in Julia, or you don't have to learn it right away. You can stick with uh, what, you're, what you're familiar with. Okay, so now we've done all of that and we're ready to model in Julia. Um, I'm putting it back. I'm getting the data set back from R now. Doesn't totally make sense because I didn't actually change it, but if you had changed it, it would be important to get it back. So maybe in the previous step, you would have wanted to transform some of your predictors um, or yeah, do other sorts of wrangling things that you wanted to save. And then you'd wanna make sure you got it back into Julia. And I'm gonna go ahead and let these guys run, but what, um, what you're gonna see here is the mixed effect it's model itself. And just to let you know what you're looking at, um, that if you've ever fit a regression model in R, you probably know the syntax of dependent variable predicted by all of your predictors. And that's gonna be the same here. But then you're also gonna have the random effects term. This is the mixed effects. This is what makes it a mixed model. And it just allows you to account for differences that are um, systematic, so here by subject. And it will allow you to have like a random intercept and a random slope. So if we look back at this, so it will allow these lines to both start at different locations on the y-axis, whether they start low or they start high. And it will allow the lines to have different slopes by participant. So they can be steep or they can be um, shallow or in the opposite direction. Okay, but um, the cool part here is that this code looks like this in R. So reaction by days plus one plus days by subject. This is the intercept and this is the slope details. But you can see that in Julia, we have um, one little extra step, which is that we create a formula with a formula macro. But everything pretty much looks the same in terms of syntax. And then we can fit the mixed model with the formula to the data um, and get our results. And this is also familiar looking results. Um, you have to take my word on it if you're not using these models very often, but we can see here, we see for example, that with each day of sleep deprivation, um, participants got about 10 milliseconds slower in average response time. And we can see that it allowed subjects to have intercepts um, and days by slope. And it even pops us out some like key values here. Now in this tiny data set, it probably doesn't make a difference which, what you run it on, but um, in the past I've run much bigger models. So if you imagine a model like this, where you have a dependent variable and this would be like a, a four-way interaction. So four variables that all um, are interrelated plus five covariates and uh, three grouping factors, one with five slopes, one with um, three slopes, well, and an interaction term in there. Something like this, um, I've never been able to really fit in R. I've really had trouble fitting this type of model in R. But in Julia, something like this can fit um, in under an hour. So this is really cool. It, it requires you to be a little bit more careful with overfitting, but it's really cool to have the, yeah, the power to fit these kinds of models. Um, this is only relevant if you actually do fit linear mixed effects models. This would be like how you code your categorical predictors. Just want to put that in there to um, encourage everyone to be really explicit in coding their categorical predictors and also just show how that looks. So you could add like a contrast, you would add the contrast argument and add these contrasts. But basically what we've done is we've um, loaded in the data in Julia, taken a look at it, but done all of our wrangling and our visualization in R. And then we've left kind of the hard part to Julia. We've let Julia do the modeling. And now we're gonna actually be able to look at the model output in R. So this would be an important point to a lot of um, modelers in this kind of way is, well, I know how to work with my model output best in R. So here I'm actually using the JellyMe4 package. This is um, particular to LME4 and mixed models. So this is a package in development by um, Philip Alday, which allows you to take mixed models output and put it directly into a format that R would see as being like an R internal 
um, LME4 item. So you have one extra step here, which is to wrap the model with the data set. This, this data type is called a tuple. So I make it called sleep model R and I wrap it, um, the model and the data, and I can send that to R as we did with everything else with R put. So the fact that we're using Jelly Me 4 is specific to sending LB4 objects. Um, but this is a really cool package. And you can see that what R has gotten is like our model output in our data frame. And then R receives that model and it sees it as if it was basically more or less made in R. So it sees it as an LMBR model. Again, that's the package that R uses for mixed models. And it knows that it can get the data from JellyMe and it has a lot of the same output. When you have this and you can do things that are convenient, for example, um, I would use like this performance library and I could check, you know, how my residuals are looking um, and what, what observations are influential. And that's, yeah, so I wouldn't have to kind of reinvent the wheel on my model diagnostics plots. I could also use like effects. This would be something you would often do with this type of model is like look at the effects. This one is very boring because there's only one term, but sometimes you would have like, you know, interdependent interactions um, or multiple terms you could look at. And you could look at, um, yeah, this is another package with a typical LMM plot. So you look at like what the intercept lands and if there's any correlation to the, to the slopes. So basically once you've sent it back to R using um, Jelly Me 4, then you can continue with all of your normal post modeling tasks in your R, your preferred R scripts or R functions. So um, just to wrap up, what, you can, what we've kind of seen here is that with the commands from R call, like um, just these R code blocks and the macros R put and R get, it's really easy to use R for visualization and wrangling, um, but, let it, uh, but let Julia do the sort of heavy lifting of modeling. So you could really harness the power of Julia right when you need it and you don't then have to, um, yeah, you don't have to relearn the same things that you would normally do in R. I use this linear mass effects model just to show you where I'm coming from, but you could really use any modeling methodology there. So any sort of machine learning or stats methodology that you saw, you know, looked into working with that in Julia, then you can substitute that in that spot. A couple of, like things that I've ran into, just be careful with missing values or if you get some weird errors, you might want to look at missing values. That was something that came up for me. Um, younger packages, you may have changes. There might be a little bit, you might have to be a little bit creative with your package management. There might be a little bit less on stack overflow. But I think with the versatility that you get from um, R call and um, these related packages, you can really harness both the, the strengths of both the languages. So I hope I've inspired you <laughs> a little bit to try, try Julia um, for your modeling. Okay, great stuff. Thanks very much for that. Uh, folks, if you're watching at home, uh, you can uh, ask some questions on the YouTube live chat. And I have it just there right beside me and I'll be able to read them out one by one. I will actually start off with some questions myself, actually. Just actually, sorry, uh, Nithin has just asked, will the slides be made available? Yeah, um, I have a GitHub repo actually made for them and I can send around that link. Um, or you can find it here, um, or I can send around the link afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, we're we gonna put it on the, the the description of the video after the fact. Uh, just a sort of quick question, actually. So, uh, how long have you been using Julia yourself? So, um, yeah. So I was introduced to Julia last summer, actually, just um, in the summer school by Uni Potsdam. Um, and they, yeah, really showed me sort of this way of working with Julia. And then I got interested in learning a little bit more about base Julia, you know, Julia programming from that. Yeah. Good stuff. And like, so uh, just so something you sort of remarked upon is that you were able to utilize a lot of your R skills already. Uh, just actually out of curiosity, is it uh, how long have you been using R as well? Oh. Good question. Um, I've been using R for significantly longer than just last summer. Um, I think I got introduced 
introduced to it like in my master's degree probably five years ago but I really started get going getting going with that when um I got involved with Our Lady Freiburg so that mm. um that was my motivation yeah to get more into R. Yeah so and and the thing has rejoined uh uh, is it compulsory that the packages should be installed in R or shall we install packages on the fly in Julia? So it's sort of probably the setup there for using R packages. Yeah, yeah when you first install the um, R call package, you can um, you, you need to look that it finds your R installation. That's the only tricky part about the installation of the R call package is you have to make sure it finds your actual R installation. Um, they have good instructions for that on the documentation, but basically if it finds your R installation, it will have all the packages installed that are installed in your R, um, your normal R, but you will have to call the packages like with a library call, like how I called um, sort of tidyverse and the LME4 package here to activate them. Good stuff. Uh, some questions are coming in there thick and fast actually. Uh, Jakob, I hope I pronounced that right. Can we use Julia in R Studio? I haven't found an IDE I enjoy as much as R Studio, but want the power of Julia. Yeah, I I, I feel you on that one. I'm I'm also a huge fan of R Studio, and I love um, a lot of what R Studio can do. And there are actually packages for working with Julia in R. But you have to remember that like R existed when Julia was being created and they and they knew that R would be like a big part of this community, whereas Julia didn't exist when R was created. So sometimes you will lose a little bit in, in speed or efficiency if you're trying to port from R out to Julia. And it seems to just work a lot smoother in the Julia environment. So I would say that, um, although I also love R Studio, that it's, it's worth it to, to try to get used to the Julia environment uh, just for the ease of using that. But there is one, uh, there is, in, in an analog for using Julia in R. Good stuff. Uh, Nathan uh, is back, uh, sorry, he has another question again. Can I leverage my complete R skills like getting LaTeX output? Um, yeah, I think you can, I think you should be able to leverage most of your R ability. So I don't know exactly what you mean by um, using uh, LaTeX, but uh, you can also for example, like use a Julia Markdown, which you'd be able to knit or um, yeah, both use Markdown and knit to, to LaTeX. Um, I think you can do most things that you can do in R. Mm. I, I just, uh, would it be fair to say like, with, let's say we're uh, producing an output that probably the divergence, there's a divergence there. Like in one respect, you have R Markdown, Shiny and all that, that would be part of the R world. Whereas in Julia, that there's a divergence there. It's Jupyter Notebooks and Pluto that there's like, there's one part where you can overlap the workflow quite a lot, but when it comes to the outputs, it's separate. So that'd be fair to say. Yeah, I think Shiny is definitely a part where it doesn't totally overlap. So I don't think that you can really use Shiny. I don't know if you can really use Shiny in Julia, um, but you can do Julia markdowns that are really similar to our markdowns as well too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Atul uh, Pragash, I am starting my master's this month. Will it be possible for me to learn R and Julia at the same time? I've learned the basics of R as of now. Um, yes, I, I would say yes, if you're, um, if you're motivated. So um, the thing is, the thing that's great about a workflow like this is that if you know how to do it in one language, you don't have to worry about immediately learning it in the other language, but you can kind of patchwork it together. Um, at some point that might get a little messy, but if you, for example, get into learning um, dplyr for data wrangling or ggplot for data visualization, then those would be great yeah. uh, additions to a Julia workflow. Good stuff. Yeah. So just a, a follow up on that question actually for myself. Um, when you are like, you were very used to R for a long time. Is, is there things that sort of like, that tripped you up, but like you had to sort of pay, pay extra attention to uh, when you were doing something very similar in Julia, for example, the colons and the types, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, um, especially with the type, um, I think Julia is a lot more explicit about missing values. So um, I, I think I was trying to like take a Z score on um, a column and I didn't realize that there was missing values in it and R might have kind of secretly dealt with that, but um, Julia kind of complained at me that this was a column of, um, 
type numeric, but also an A, which makes it a column of type any, and then it wouldn't z-score it. So it was, it's a little bit more specific in terms of um, types. Okay. I took the easy workaround of just dropping the NAs in that situation, but uh, yeah, the type system's a little different. Okay, that, that, yeah, that's very interesting to know. So the, 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 about the, the, the importance of types, the emphasis on types, uh, which is not really there at all in R. So, well, it is, but like it's, yeah. uh, you know, it, 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 it's very, the types are very fluid concept in R. Uh, Jakob uh, asks, um, what's the best environment for Julia in your opinion? Is it Jupiter or is there a better IDE for Julia that mimics our studio? Yeah, so I'm actually a fan of um, Visual Studio Code. They have a plugin for Julia um, and they also have a plugin for R within Julia. So they have like a special plugin for using R in Julia, which will give you syntax highlighting in R in yeah. Julia. So um, I use that. It's a little bit more lightweight, so I don't always need to like launch this in the browser and have um, these sorts of functions. But sometimes I like to work just in this text format of a Julia markdown, where I just define the text and the and the code blocks. Yeah, yeah. I just noticed actually using Jupyter that is very clear and, and legible on the screen to read. Uh, which is, is that what sort of influenced your decision to use Jupyter notebooks because just like it, it, like when you put YouTube up on full screen, it's very clear to read. And I, I like that, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I like that you can um, separate blocks of code and then just run each block and see what happens. I think that makes it clear what's happening in each of the steps. Okay, uh, but yeah. if I was running it myself, sometimes you don't want to have to go through all of the blocks. Yeah. Good stuff. But. Um, sorry, uh, Nathan has just asked, what is the name of that plugin? I use VS Code. So. I, we might have to clarify what that means, that question is. Oh yeah, sorry. So um, Visual Studio Code has like a lot of plugins for anyone who hasn't used it before. It's kind of a text editor, but you can tell it which languages you often use and then it will sort of recognize those languages. So it's kind of a text editor. And if you, if you have a Python plugin, you start writing in Python, it will realize that it's Python. And when you run it, it will open like a Python terminal and it will kind of highlight your code in colors based on Python code to make it more re readable. And I think there's one called, I think it's just called Julia. So in Visual Studio Code, you can search for plugins. One's called Julia and one I think is like R syntax embedded in Julia or R in Julia, embedded in Julia syntax highlighting. Um, but I think if you search for like R in Julia, this should come up. And it's more of a luxury just to have like, you know, syntax highlighting to make sure you haven't made like a typo. Yeah. Good stuff, yeah. And just a sort of, um, you, you talked about, sorry, I just asked my own question here. Uh, I just actually, uh, to raise the matter first off, that you introduced linear mixed effects models. And I believe that those type, that model framework is used very widely in health science and life science and natural uh, science, I believe. And that R uh, was historically the home for it, but, you know, uh, obviously, you found that Jupiter, Julia is uh, more useful. Just actually, just tell us more about that, actually, um, if you get me. Yeah, so um, I think R was like a big, R was kind of the default that a lot of, especially academic applications use for working with linear mixed effects models. This LME4 package is probably the, the core of very many methods courses um, in academia and all sorts of different disciplines for running this kind of a model, especially anything that deals with um, experimental designs. But a lot of the, the, the minds behind LME4 or especially um, like, for example, um, Doug Bates has kind of moved over to Julia and is now working a lot with um, this mixed models package. And you, I think you can really see that the mixed models package is made with users of R in mind because it uses really similar syntax and it's, um, especially with these add-on packages like Jelly Me for that really are built to allow you to work in exactly this kind of a workflow. So I think the focus has shifted or is shifting towards Julia, but all of the developers are doing a really great job at, you know, not leaving behind everyone sort of stranded in R, but pulling them along and making it really easy to switch and to really utilize like the power of Julia for this application. Good stuff. I, I also, I, I, I like the fact that 
uh, this is just a sort of a very uh, important or a very useful case in point about linear mixed effects models is that it does present a case or like a very useful case for a, a combined workflow, a dual workflow as you, as you, the title of your talk is. Yeah. Um, that's it. Sorry, just actually, I just got to, sorry, I just got one more question here. I believe uh, uh, Maxim is the name. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, do you know if the speed of Julia is comparable to C++, uh, e.g. called with uh, RCPP from R? Yeah, so I think that the speed of Julia is comparable to C and C++. Yeah. Um, I think in some things C still tends to win a little bit, but I think also it takes a lot more to, to learn C. So I don't think that you could have this kind of like a dual workflow with C and R. Um, yeah. C is also really statically typed, so you really have to put a lot. It's a little bit harder on the programmer, I think. Whereas Julia really gives you a lot more of a readability and flexible programming um, without sac with having very comparable speeds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Uh, that, 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 like, just as a sort of a uh, remark uh, again, that the, there's a lot of uh, probably very useful and pertinent talks coming up at JuliaCon. Uh, JuliaCon.org. So, it we, we there's a sort of probably a scope here that maybe some of the questions would be better off for the JuliaCon if you get me. Uh, just actually, I'm going to sort of switch uh, the direction here a little bit myself, if you don't mind. You are part of Our Ladies Freiburg. Just tell us about Our Ladies Freiburg and uh, what's been going on with Our Ladies Freiburg over the last year. Yeah, sure. So I always like an opportunity to talk about Our Ladies Freiburg. Um, we, so if you're not familiar with Our Ladies, I assume most of you are, but it's um, an initiative for R for including um, women and gender minorities in our community. And in Our Ladies Freiburg, I co-organize with um, Elisa Schneider, Julia Muller, and also um, uh, Divya Sinanio, uh, also sometimes. And we do workshops twice a month. So we're pretty regular on the workshops. We have one coming up on Tuesday, which um, Elisa will be doing, which will be about working with Git and GitHub in our studio. And we tend to do kind of one big workshop a month where we teach something totally new. And we do one, right now we're doing one like guided tidy Tuesday every month where we just live code and kind of hang out and that. So the big workshops are also recorded and they're on like the Our Ladies Global. So we did, um, Recently, we've done a couple on text analysis. We did a bunch on tidyverse data wrangling, um, tidyverse, and we had some guest speakers. So yeah, it's really great. Um, yeah, it's a lot of, it's a big passion of mine, Our Ladies Freiburg. Yeah, it seems to be one of the very active chapters that like up uh, in, in Europe, at least, that's very, very much like at the, at the heart of what, like a lot of what is going on. And also just actually, I know that I think your colleague was on the chat there, uh, Julia as well, Mueller. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, just a sort of hello to her as well. And just a sort of uh, very impressive work for the both of you with the Our, Our, the Our Ladies chapter in Freiburg. Uh, just actually, just to tell us a little bit about your own work yourself, your, your day job, so to speak, and how that relates to our data science, or not data science, like programming and so on. Yeah, so I do, um, I do experimental research in linguistics. We look a lot at um, individual variants in how people process language. So um, specifically with a view of how they have sort of a predictive completion of language. So how you um, understand what other people are going to say before they say it oh, very vaguely. Um, so I do psycholinguistic experiments, which are often like reading experiments. We look at a lot of reading times. And um, my methodology looks a lot like this, what I showed you. So this little demo is very similar to what I would do. I definitely am not the person who is ready to give up on my, my tidyverse wrangling, my tidyverse visualization, um, but linear mixed specs models are indeed like a big core of what, what we do. Um, so a lot of what I do from an, an academic perspective focuses on, on this, but um, I'm also really, a big fan of stats and of R. So that's what I put a lot of my time into um, as a PhD student, I kind of have that flexibility. And I do some sort of statistics um, study groups and R ladies. And so I try to do as much R and as much um, programming as I possibly can. Good stuff. Yeah, no, it's just a, it's a sort of interesting for like, uh, like a lot of our audience will be, let's say, um, 
maybe like master students in data science. So it's very interesting to see uh, uses of R in and D Julia in other disciplines, like for example, like the psychology and linguistics the disciplines and so on. So I just turned my phone off there. Uh, so it's, you know, it's just like, it's a sort of very big world of R and you know, that like, it's, 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 it's very interesting to see all of the expanse of it. Sorry, uh, just a sort of a remark that Nithin has one more question. Uh, one last thing, Kyla. How do we export only part of regression output of Julia to R? I, I mean, what if I want to export only R square from Julia to R? Like, can we subset the output like we can in R? Um, I, you might be able to. I think it probably depends exactly on what package and what sort of a setup you're using in Julia. Um, but also, I don't think you really lose a lot by just sending R the whole model, and then you could kind of subset the output in R just how you would be able to do if it was like a a natural R output. So personally, okay. I would probably just send the whole date, send the whole output, and then just grab the part out in R. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm really like a path of least resistance kind of person, so I think that's <laughs> that, that's how yeah. I would do it. And just yeah. to add to that, actually, a package I'm very big fan of is Broom, where you are able to turn a regression output into a tidy uh, into a tidy table or a data frame, mm -hmm. and so on, which is also uh, very interesting, actually. Um, I think we. Uh, I'll just uh, leave it there, actually. Just if, if anybody has any questions, that was a great Q and A there. Uh, just actually, over the last year, uh, this has been recorded in July 2021. Uh, just to sort of how has the whole last year been for you as an R programmer, member of the community, uh, you know, uh, somebody uh, uh, in Freiburg with the COVID yeah. crisis and all that. Right. Yeah. Um, I think this has been, it's been, you know, I think there's been a lot of challenges and a lot of personal hardship for a lot of people with working, um, you know, even just on a very small level of isolation and working alone. But uh, I think see this also as a great opportunity for the, for the R community. I know from my experience with R ladies, um, how much we've been able to see a great like spreading and mixing, you know, at our events, we have people from all over the world and we really went from like a small local chapter to, you know, an open, an open source. Um, and I really also appreciate all the other R ladies chapters and all the cool events that they're putting on and the conferences like JuliaCon coming up, everything that you can attend virtually, you, you know, you really have no barrier to learning um, a lot of R and Julia very quickly. So I think there's definitely a very strong silver lining. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, I think we'll leave it there. Th uh, thanks very much, Kyla, for joining us. Uh, we hopefully we'll be uh, joining us again soon with uh, some more uh, insights. Uh, 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 also, if there's any, uh, like, is there uh, Our Ladies Freiburg there on Twitter, I believe? Yeah, we're at our at Our Ladies Freiburg, and we're also most of our events are posted on Meetup. You can look for yeah. Our Ladies Freiburg. So yeah, yeah. So see you again. Yeah, so there, there, there'll probably be lots of interesting stuff going on there. Uh, I'm going to sort of just uh, uh, thank Kyla and just thanks everyone for coming. Uh, uh, Douglas Bates has just joined us there. Congratulations on a great presentation, Kyla. I'm surprised and delighted with your examples. Excellent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Um, just to, uh, 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 to sort of uh, close um, uh, and on, on, the, uh, uh, on that note, uh, we are going to do a couple of YR, our, the YR Foundation are going to do a handful of webinars over the summer. And uh, we've already picked out our topics. Uh, but if anybody has uh, interested in giving a webinar over, for, let's say, September, October, November, uh, we be, would be very delighted to uh, host you, uh, particularly if you're new to speaking and so on. Uh, YR obviously is an R-focused uh, foundation, but we're not only R, we're mostly R. And we're also very interested in the collaborations and the sort of the synergies of R, Python, Julia, and other open source languages. So we're very open to some interesting uh, collaborations between different projects. Uh, and just to sort of remark again, something we're very interested in going forward is seeing how R, Python, and Julia can be used to support sustainable development goals. Uh, that's a sort of theme that uh, both ourselves and some other organizations are going to be exploring in the next year. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Kyla. And hopefully we'll be talking again soon. I'm going to leave it there, folks. I'm going to switch off.
And goodbye. Goodbye from Ireland. Now, that was very good.